10 police cars pull up, guns pointed. It took the whole team into jail. For the night, we get a call. Well, let's talk now to someone with more followers than the population of the Netherlands. 20 million followers on Instagram and Facebook. With more than 40 followers, million yes. followers across Steve. their social media platform. The... I couldn't do magic, couldn't go within six feet of anyone. My entire trajectory stopped. That's when I realized there had been a crazy change in the algorithm. It's like early days of Bitcoin. I could see the formula. If you can do that, the video will get picked up. Up to this point, I'd never made my first million dollars. Two months later, boom, a million dollars in a month. When I was in London, I was like, that's never why I worked this hard. I was never inspired by the money. Can you show me some magic? This entire time, I've actually been influencing a card on you. What was it? Three of hearts. Have you ever received a call from someone claiming to be from the Social Security Administration just to later realize that it was a scam? Maybe you've been a victim of one of these scams and have lost out on money. I've had thousands of people message me on Instagram telling me how they've fallen victim to these financial scams. The FTC said that from these scams, victims lost a total of $8.8 billion last year. If these scammers manage to get their hands on your social security number, they can do all sorts of dangerous things, such as open up fake tax accounts or even steal your benefits. That's why I think it's so important to make sure you're protecting yourself online. That's where today's sponsor, Delete Me, comes in handy. I've been using them to keep my information safe online. All you do is submit your information and their experts will find and remove your information so that it doesn't end up where it shouldn't be. My first report that they sent me, they found 36 places where my information, things like my address, had been leaked and they're handling removing them all for me. If you want to stay safe from scammers, you don't want to be in the dark and you need to find out where your personal information has been leaked online. You can do so now by using code Erica for 20% off your plan. Just go to joindeleteme.com slash Erica, that's Erica with a K, and sign up to start staying safe online. I'm Erica Kohlberg and you're listening to the Erica Taught Me podcast. Julius Dean, number one most viewed Facebook page last year with 45 billion views, which is insane. How did you get your start in content creation? Wow, that's a lot of views. Yeah. But it wasn't always a lot of views. And I started as a young, hungry magician, London born, loved doing magic. I would be like that 11 year old that would turn up at the Christmas party with my silk and my pack of cards and go around showing everyone magic and all the polite families would be like, oh, yeah, you know, my, my auntie and my mom, oh yeah, well, very good, very good. You know, so I'd do the same trick <laughs> um, on everyone. But, but you know, <laughs> it grew, I grew a lot. I, I love entertaining, love the magic. I love the effect the magic has on people. I'm a natural extrovert and I, it's just an amazing tool to connect with people. And as I got older, it became from a passion to a business. Yeah. When I was 15 years old, I got my first proper gig. I got, got paid 60 pounds, like $80 US, yeah. to perform at a birthday party. I was like, wow, I'm an entrepreneur. <laughs> and then when I was 17, 18, you know, I met, I met my first girlfriend through magic, you know, impressing girls at university. I would it kind of evolve where I, where I was at university. I studied international relations at King's College London. I would use magic at like, I would get hired for gigs, like higher, higher end gigs, like corporate dinners and bar mitzvahs and glammy birthday parties, all the kind of the London city scene. Eventually at university, hosted my first video on YouTube. While you were still a student? Whilst I was a student. And I did it blow up right away or no? No, 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 a lot of, lot of try fail. Didn't see any success on YouTube. Tried different platforms, Instagram, maybe Instagram's gonna be good to me, no. <laughs> <laughs> and then Facebook. And then I posted my videos on Facebook. A big blue share button allowed me to find some secret hacks yeah. to go super viral that I'm sure we're gonna dive into on this podcast episode. For sure. But Facebook was my baby and that's how I blew on social. What was the first viral video you had? First viral video I did was, I did this tr trick where I was like levitating on thin air. I sit on like an invisible chair. Yeah. That was the first viral video I had on Facebook. And yeah. was it just instant? The algorithm picked it up right away? No. No, it wasn't, it, it wasn't instant. It required me on the back end to social media market it. Back a few years ago, engineering virality was quite easy on Facebook, I'll be honest with you. And when I say easy, I don't mean easy in that like everyone and anyone could do it. But honestly, with the knowledge that I had, 
it, w- it would be quite easy. Can you share any of that now? Can I share? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the I'm like not sure if I'm supposed to ask. No, no, no. Uh, you can ask. You can ask. And, and this, you know, I'm, I'm glad to share. So what happened is a few years ago, and, and don't get me wrong, by the way, the platforms are improving. The AI is improving. The algorithms are mm-hmm. getting smarter, right? So back in the day, why would a video go viral? It's about shares, likes, and comments. Now it's about retention. So content creators, whether it's you or me, or anyone, biggest, Logan Paul, whoever, whoever you want to go with, you have to adapt to the changing times of content, right? Yeah. So back when I first started posting videos on Facebook when I was 21, 22, my strategy was to find big pages that would share my videos. So I would reach out to hundreds of, literally hundreds of pages on Facebook, pages with 100,000 followers, a million followers. You just message them on Facebook. And me, 21-year-old Julie Steen, hello, I've got a video. You know, would you please be able to share it? It's a really cool magic trick. I would would message, 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 message. And eventually, one day, I found a guy called Mayor Boss, Mm -hmm. big Facebook page with 8 million followers. And he's like, yeah, man. And he responded to me. Couldn't believe it. So he shared my video and that helped it go viral. But there's a whole, there's a whole story of like how I took something I found, which was the share button. And I, I, I really utilized that tool to go viral on Facebook. And I found share partners. Does right? that still work now? Less so now because the algorithms got smarter. Five, six years ago, I mean, it was crazy. The way I blew my first like five, 10 million followers on Facebook was finding some, some big Facebook pages that would share my content. It's like how YouTubers collaborate, right? You know, yeah. you, you get in the video of a big YouTuber, he shouts at your channel and boom, you're gonna grow 50, 100,000 followers. It's much easier on Facebook in a way because if I find a big Facebook page, million followers, half million followers, 10 million followers, they can just click the share button, boom. If my video is a good video, it mm-hmm. will start to go viral. Okay, so I wanna talk about the business because mm. something great must have happened for you to become the number one most viewed page last year. Was there something where you figured out the algorithm and how it works or what happened? It's been a whirlwind. It started with the magic, built up this global brand, millions of followers, and then the pandemic hit. I wasn't doing magic. Also fell in love, went on a honeymoon, traveled the world, Colombia, Ibiza, just <laughs> wasn't even on my phone. I'm gonna just live the J. Alvarez beach life, right? But be like bawling beach bumps, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, but um, going back to it, pandemic hit and we started making videos on Facebook. The honeymoon was over. The honeymoon was over, <laughs> right? And, and we saw this opportunity on Facebook. Okay, the pandemic hit. There was no way I was doing street magic now. And, and I started filming street magic tricks with Estelle. We were like making magic videos and posting on TikTok. And we're like trying to make the best of a situation because we had a few months off and I was starting to get the itch. Yeah. You know, the itch to make content. I was like, right, back to it, back to content. We saw these videos going viral on Facebook, like a few Facebook pages, like Paul Vu, Rick Lax, Jabrizi. I saw them pop in like 100 million views a video. Me and Estelle were like, well, we can do this and we can do it better. So we recreated one of these like sketches and posted it on Facebook. And I was really nervous to post it. I was like, oh, do I want to post this other content? I'm like, is this what I want to be posting? Um, but it was a pandemic. Because it was so different from the content you normally So posted. different, yeah, it was so different. But it was a pandemic. I couldn't do magic, couldn't go within six feet of anyone, right? Stuck inside, nothing to do. Like I wasn't performing at events. Like my entire trajectory of being a world traveling street magician stopped. And we were having fun as well, right? Like we were, we were, we were having fun making content, doing posting on TikTok. You know, I just made a TikTok, it just blew to a million followers, posting magic, you know, that little girlfriend, boyfriend, prank sketches, all that type of stuff, right? Um, just kind of cruising through the pandemic, I think, as a lot of people did just readjusting, just finding my feet. Yeah. And then we saw these videos going viral on Facebook with you know, hundreds of millions of views. And I went, how are they posting a video on Facebook and it's like 150 million views when I would travel to the furthest corners of Johannesburg, South Africa, going into the slums, doing street magic, making a three minute video, it would take me a month to make and my video would get 100 million views. I would spend a month producing quality content. They'd be knocking up a funny sketch from their bedroom and they'd be getting 150 million views. And that's when I realized there had been a crazy change in the algorithm. It's like early days of Bitcoin. So me and Estelle buddied up. We started, you know, doing magic tricks and pranks and sketches. But anyway, we posted our first video. Right? It was like some dumb challenge. Like some dumb challenge. We, 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 like, we, we, we tried the formula. I could see the formula. Formula was like 
keep, make the introduction snappy, make it constantly progressive, keep the audience till the end of the video, the three minute mark. If you can do that in an exciting way, the video will get picked up. So we made the video, took an hour, posted it on my Facebook page. Boom, 80,000 live viewers. 80,000 live viewers. Yeah, I mean, it did 150 million views in, in three days on a Facebook video. Made a lot of money. How does Facebook pay compared to YouTube? I'm familiar with YouTube, so I know for the finance space, it's like a $20 CPM. It really varies from, from video to video. Like if it goes viral in the Philippines, it will have a lower CPM. If it goes viral in the UK, it will have a higher CPM. So all it's all obviously like just like how the ads, ads run supply and demand. A good video on Facebook can make hundred thousand dollars, two hundred thousand dollars from a single from, video. From a single video. Oh, I had no idea it was to that level. Yeah. So it's very it's very hit and miss. Sometimes a video with hundred million views will make twenty thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars. But generally, you'd expect to be in the range like. 30 to 100K. And so once you had that first viral hit, you were like, this is something I need to grab onto while the trend's lasting. So yeah, so that day I made more money on Facebook than I'd ever made in the last seven years. So it was just a kind of moment of like, whoa, I have been grinding on magic. Up to this point, I'd, I'd, ne I'd never made my first million dollars. Two months later, I did a million dollars in a month on Facebook videos. So we just went hard. So you became a millionaire just within a few months of doing Facebook. Yeah, So, but, but, but it was, we saw that it was an algorithm change and retention was the number one metric. I was in early with a few Facebook creators that had realized retention was the name of the game, right? And there's like 10 Facebook pages. A magic trick that could be done in 30 seconds. We'd make it a, th a three minute presentation. Magic trick, pranks, sketches, all different things. Me and Estelle were just popping it every single day, like content, content, content. Like it was a whirlwind. Living in Mexico during the pandemic, mining, Facebook videos. You quickly had to build a team around you. At the time I didn't, it was me and Estelle. Right? And she was great. She was, she's a video editor. She had me on the creative. So we, we, we was kind of like two person team. Yeah. You know, yeah, living in some like little apartment at the time because uh, it took a while to yeah. like figure out like this is like a real thing. When did it feel real? I think it probably felt real a long time later, probably six months later, six to eight months later when I moved into like a big house. Because by that time my team had expanded. I'm a bit like you, I'm careful with money. I don't spend me on my, beyond my means. I still don't spend me on beyond. Yeah, you don't. You know, I'm still very, you know, I don't wear anything designer. Very rarely, you know, I don't, I'm not living in like a fancy place, but you know, the roots of who I am is not to be flash. But as I built my team, they were like, Julius, we can't be living in some dutty apartment. <laughs> like we're running a global viral multi-million dollar Facebook vid business now. Like you're no longer Julius Dean, world champion magician. Like we're running an operation. Cause all my friends start to live with me. That's, yeah. late, that's a later story. I ended up moving into like a really sick house. And it was like, I'd never, before that time spent more than a couple of thousand dollars a month on rent. And then we ended up moving into like a crazy house. I think the rent was like 15 to 20K a month, which was affordable now as it hadn't been before, mm -hmm. but it was crazy. It was like, what? I'm spending that much a day on rent. Like that was what I'd spend a month. But your whole team was living with you too. Yeah. Yeah. It was like, yeah. But that's a, that's a, we're, we're jumping the gun here, <laughs> running it back. Estelle and me, some other Facebook pages, and we're just popping videos every single day. Wake up, film video. What's it going to be? But it was, you know, it was a grind. It was a grind. Then you build the team. Oh, so it wasn't healthy because me and Estelle wanted different things. So my ex-girlfriend, like she's not content hungry, crazed person like me. Like I'm obsessively like focused on whatever I'm doing. If it's magic, I do magic. If it's viral videos, I do viral videos. Like it's very exciting. Long story short, we broke up because we wanted different things. And I, you know, I wanted to get to number one in the world on Facebook. Like there was this opportunity in the pandemic with like literally nothing else to really do, kind of go outside. And, and I'm sitting like from my bedroom, from my mobile phone going viral. So I have my team, right? My magic team. These guys are like trained in the art of creative content in the art of magic. Cause they worked with me for years. Mm -hmm. I have my main guy, Lee, who's my Irish videographer. He used to travel all over the world with me doing magic. My friend from a cruise ship when I was 16 is hypey guy, speaks Spanish, he's called Josh. Like had a goop who's, you know, just like a really funny, big TikToker guy. Like, you know, it's like self-proclaimed, like I'm <laughs> fat. So, you know, he, he <laughs> it's part of, part, of his, part of his character, you know? I got them all flights out to Mexico. So they all came and lived with me my little apartment. I'm like, guys, there's something here. I like, let's, let's do this. But at the time I was going through a breakup as well. And that actually hit me very hard. And I was very sad, right? mm -hmm. I was very, very sad. My first ever breakup. So it was uh, just very, very sad, you know? So I really couldn't be in the videos. So I took a step out, but I wanted to keep going. This is cool. This is like amazing. So I taught my team how to make these viral videos. Next thing I knew, we had a chef because we wanted to be efficient. We had a, we had a, we had a runners, we had a content team, we had magic consultants, we had prop, we had a prop room. Like it evolved into a really professional and we we're in the, a prime position to just create content. Um, and then we just, you know, we became a family with the aim to just be on top 
And it was like this prize dream of like, yeah, let's go viral. Were you creating content every single day? Every single day, worked seven days a week until we got burnt out and then we went to six and then we got burnt out again, so we went to five. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we didn't know how long this was gonna last. But at the time, we were living in the moment and it really did feel like there'd been a mistake on the algorithm. It's like, what? Just make the video three minutes long. Now, don't get me wrong, we also had a formula. I, I, in, I invented, like I, I, I bullet pointed and formalized a formula for every single video, right? The introduction has to happen within one to three seconds. Yeah. It has to be visually interesting without sound, meaning that the whole world understand it, right? Video is gonna get 500 million views or 900 million views or 200 million views if people understand it from all over the world. That was the, that was the, the engineering of our content. Um, it has to be constantly progressive. Right, so you can't blow your load in the first thirty seconds. Mm -hmm. You have to navigate them through the videos, right? Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, it has to be it has to be um, nothing, nothing over, nothing sexual or, or provocative, so it doesn't get demonetized. You no know, fighting. Um, we had a whole, you know, we had a whole, we had a whole checklist of things. We were like tick, 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 like ten things. Even though I have these world-class health experts come on the Erica Taught Me podcast and tell me that I need to exercise, recently I've been finding it quite difficult to stay motivated when it comes to exercise. And if I'm being honest, by recently, I mean it's been years since I've had a consistent workout routine. January 1st of every year, I'll get motivated and say, this is the year I'm going to get fit. But then I slip back into my old habits. But this time, things are going to be different, actually. I want to prioritize my health. I want to feel strong. I want to feel like I'm taking care of my body. To achieve this, I've discovered Copilot, and I'm just a few weeks in, but let me tell you, it's been a game changer. With Copilot, you download the app and you get assigned an expert coach. Mine is amazing. We got on a kickoff call where we talked about everything from my goals, what I want to achieve. I told her that I have a bad lower back, so I want to make sure that the exercises don't hurt it. Then she assigned me my workouts. The workouts are customized for you and you can work out at any time at the gym or home, wherever you are. Your expert coach is there for you. I was sick recently and you can kind of hear I'm still getting over it. So I messaged her in the app and she gave me an easy 10 minute stretch to do instead of the normal workout. I'm so excited to be kicking off my health journey with Copilot. And if you've been wanting to kickstart your health, then click the link in the description because they're going to be giving you a 14 day free trial with your own personal trainer. And did Facebook eventually figure out that we need to shift the algorithm? Initially, I was like, this is too good to be true. Yeah. But the reality of it is, no, we were making amazing videos. At the end of the day, what is entertainment? If people are watching until the end of the videos, that must say something about the videos. That's entertainment. Right? And we were, and look, we do the prank, the comedy sketches, and, and they would like eventually like stop doing so well. Yeah. And then we shift to like, you know, always magic, by the way. Magic's hard. People were commenting like, yo, Julius, you got to do magic. Like, do more magic. Like, it's tough to do magic, right? Because like, when you're trying to get 200 million views, like on a video, which is like, now I'd built a team and now I had expenses, I had a house, I had you know, 10 employees, I had video editors, like, you know, like, it's not so easy to just do magic every day. Like my magic videos, my quality magic videos that, that blew me up, take me a month to make yeah. one video. Like gotta do the magic tricks on different people, find the best reactions, put it together, edit it. Like it was, a, you know, whereas like the Facebook videos we could do three a day, two, three, four videos, original, three minute videos a day. There's a really funny story that you told me when we first met about one of your team members that you brought over. We found this thing that went really viral on Facebook, which was CCTV recreations, right? And we'd, and we'd always say very clearly about it, like these videos are for entertainment purposes only. They're scripted comedy. So it's not like we're not like, trying to palm these off as real videos. We say these aren't real videos. And we'd also say at the end, like, you know, a positive message, like watch out for yourself. You know, like, you know, if you see someone in danger, try and help out. But got this guy out from, from London, right? This guy was like a really talented creative and also, um, you know, he's also a performer. Right? So he really wants to be in the videos. But day one of the job, we, we put him in a, in a police outfit and we made him do like a kind of a, a police officer pulls over a car on the side of the road. Yeah. I, don't even, I can't remember what the video was. Like I wasn't actually, it was like the video was like a corrupt police officer. They go out, the whole team, we got the tripod, we got the, the video camera, the guy's name, we'll call him P. He went and did this like sketch where like he arrested someone, like a short film. As he's doing the video, 10 police cars pull up, guns pointed at him and the whole team. Yeah, they're like, or impersonating a police officer. They took the whole team into jail for like four or five people. Now, four of those people were let out two hours later because the grounds for arresting them was questionable. So what do they actually do? 
they weren't dressed up as police officers, but the one guy they got they got slung in a cell, right, with no phone, no communication, thrown in with a bunch of Mexican inmates in Mexico, was this one guy, Pete, right, this new 19-year-old newbie, oh just come out to Mexico to, to, to be the videos and be part of the content team and be in, be in the sketches. This is his first time. He's an <laughs> he's, he's aspiring theatre performer. An hour went by, three hours went by, six hours went by. Like, like, like we, you know, we're standing outside the police station. All of us were like, you know, we're worried for him. He's such a nice guy. Yeah, we, we just, we couldn't get him, get in communication with him. Like, I think this is like a scare tactic that they used. Get you scared so that you pay. Eventually, at 6 p.m., we got to have one call with him. You know, I spoke to him. I said, hey, P. Are uh, you okay, mate? He goes, hi, oh, Julius. Um, yeah, they're saying I could, I could be, be in jail for up to two years for, for impersonating a police officer. Um, uh, what do I do? Do, do I call the embassy? And I'm like, stay calm. I'm going to get you out. Because like, we, we, we knew that we could get him out if we paid a ransom to get him out somehow, some way. So anyway, 11 p.m., you know, just before midnight, we, we managed to strike, strike a deal, let's say, with the police. <laughs> <laughs> and we bailed his ass out. Wow. And so he, he came out and, um, you yeah, know, he, he was uh, never the same. <laughs> <laughs> I bet he didn't work for you much longer. No. Did he quit that day? No, he didn't quit. He, he, he actually played out his, his contract, which was, a short, which, was, which was a short trial. But it definitely didn't help the, you know, it's, it's a pretty scary day one on the job. He gets arrested. So, yeah, it's been a wild year and a half since the pandemic. A year and a half, two years, switching from Magic to running a production company. And now, flipping back kind of <laughs> to, to the next, over to the next chapter. Before we get to the next chapter, yeah. what do you think you did well with the viral content house, viral, viral production house, and what do you think you wish you would have done differently? So what I did well is, number one, jumping on an opportunity as early as I could. Two, finding amazing talent. But three, working from an environment that pushed us forward and allowed us to be as creative as possible. I, I, I built an environment for content creation. And all of this, don't get me wrong, I'm winging this as I go. Like, I don't know how long this is going to last. I don't know what's going on. Like, I've never paid for multiple people to like fly out. Like before the pandemic, I had a great global magic brand, but like my skills as a manager, no experience. Mm -hmm. Never even worked a corporate job before. So I'm learning on the go. But you know, I had friends, I had experience. They helped me and I helped them. They told me, hey, we need a bigger place. I said, oh my gosh, that's so expensive. They're like, well, you know, you're, <laughs> you're running a big company now. I said, okay, you know, signed, you know, you know on this big place for six months, you know, then, Upgraded, oh Julius, you know we need a production room. You need to start, you know, getting, giving us, give us the Amex, so you can we can buy our own props. Julius, we need a chef. Like why are we ordering Uber Eats every day? A chef, yeah, it's gonna make more. So they're help. They're my friends. Yeah, right. They're helping me. I'm helping them. Yeah, we're we're all just working together to to kind of build this kind of production company, you know. And I think a common enemy is also very helpful. Like our common enemy was like. The Rick Lax, Paul Vu, Justin Flom squad. These are the other. <laughs> I'm surprised you're naming them. Listen, I don't. I have no shame. Right? I, have, I have no shame. Right, and I'm, it's the same for them as well. Like, I'm not saying an actual enemy. Like, I talk to these guys all the time. Like, yeah. you know, I, I chat with Rick Lax, and these these other guys also killing it on Facebook. Every company, you know, Uber will compete against Kareem or Lyft. Lyft you know, yeah. KFC against McDonald's. Like, you'll look at some other, you know, um, finance YouTubers. You'll be like, oh, we're gonna we, we need to beat their views this month. Like, it's healthy. <laughs> it's, it's healthy. I, I, I think, I think. Yeah. Obviously, I'm not saying in a serious sense that I'd hate them, but that kind of common, like, we're in this and we have competition and we stand together and we're going to try and beat their views. That's fun. For sure. Friendly competition. For sure. So I think that was some things that I did well, but it wasn't even I did it. Like, it's never done in, like, a corporate way. Like, as I say, like, we were really, like, you know, building and, you know, I was hard. It was all, it was a lot of things were happening at once. Yeah. Those are some things that helped us really get to number one in the world. And, and then what about something you would do differently? And then, oh my gosh, so many things I did differently. <laughs> Just one. Gee, okay, well, number one, I wouldn't live with all my employees. Yeah. Number two, I would have probably split the brands up so rather than it be Julius Dean posting everything. I would have made new channels for all of the content and maybe it would have been significantly less profitable at the beginning, mm -hmm. but I think it would have had more long-term longevity. I would have hired a COO, or operations manager slash HR to manage everything to do with employee mental health, to do with their own personal, like, like any problems they have, like they can go to someone whose role it is. So someone to operationally manage everything. Like yeah. it was very, very intense. I was going from being a magician to- Worrying about yourself and then suddenly you have a whole team of people. Yeah, it was just, just a lot of things were happening every day, all the time. Like you wake up in the morning, we turn up, the content team are planning ideas for the day. They go out, sometimes I'm on call, sometimes I'm not. I kind of go from almost 
you know, a managerial role to a, a recruiting role, you know, my, my lead video editor's hurt his hands. Now I've got to like jump on LinkedIn, start running LinkedIn ads. I've got, my, I've got someone called John who's like my support manager. Yeah. He's helping me. You know, I'm now looking through LinkedIn applications, trying to hire video editors from London, um, you know, or, or, or America or Mexico or wherever we were, you know, where, wherever. Um, just a lot of things were happening at once when the reality is like in my life, and, and it's been a great learning experience of what I want and what I don't want, but I don't want to be like a corporate manager in my life like that's not my passion to be in, in like that type of setting like recruiting like I love the creative yeah right and I want to be creative and I want to keep creating amazing content and so yeah so like a lot a lot of lessons and it's it's been a, a crazy ride like at the time it felt like the coolest thing in the world like we're it is of, so cool it's so it's cool like, I was cool. during the pandemic got to give all my friends you know amazing jobs financial freedom for a lot of them. financial freedom for a lot of them I mean you know multiple people in the, in the team essentially bought their first house Wow. from from this business been a hell of a ride so now the exciting stuff what is the next chapter yeah the next chat next chapter is now post pandemic i intend to scale back to the magic honestly back to the magic the personal brand content I think that what happened was awesome and served in such a such a positive lessons and from a business level it was very exciting to like be able to scale a business but i think that like that was a lesson for me and what i did want and what i didn't want mm -hmm. and i and i've learned from this that money it's not the source of happiness. Money's like not the solution. Yeah. And it didn't make me happy. I would far more focus my attention on creating like amazing content, which serves a higher purpose of bringing goodness to the world and content that I can be proud of. And like the magic content is awesome. So we're going on a film trip to Mumbai next week. I try and make some incredible magic content with, you know, in the slums of, of, of India and orphanages and just, I want to just bring back amazing content to the channels. I'm still sort of adjusting to like being out of Mexico and, and um, it's been a, been, a, been, a, been a crazy journey. How do you think of the money that you're going to be leaving behind? Obviously leaving the Facebook viral content space, you're leaving money on the table. Yeah, yeah, which is why I wish I'd split the channels, I'll be honest with you, because that in itself was its own business and brand. Mm -hmm. Like this kind of satire channel, that's its own thing, its own channel, right? But I linked the two together. Didn't really at the time want to post a video that could go super, super viral, make a lot of money. Like I didn't want to post that on like a channel with like 300 likes, it doesn't really make sense to me. But Came to a point in my career where I'm like, right, what do I want here? What do I want? Do I want to just keep making viral videos that, that are kind of nameless, virals, like fun? Or do I want to like serve my passion, which I've worked for for seven years? And, you know, I got back to London. When I was in London, I was like, hmm, it's not what I wanted. That's never why I worked this hard. I was never inspired by the money. That's not why I like, traveled the world doing magic. Yeah. You know, when you ask me like, what is the best thing about what you do? It's the community. That connection I have with people following a journey. And I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love being the world traveling street magician. I love bringing joy to people's lives through magic. And so I was like, you know what, the money, it's not my passion anymore. So I went through the videos on, on Facebook. I, I took a whole load of videos down. Wow. So I took hundreds of videos. I was just like, you know what? All of them generating revenue from Facebook viral videos, right? But I just unlisted 95% like of the videos. There was a few videos I kept because I thought they were quite funny. <laughs> <laughs> like, they were like, we had a few videos. We had like this th video called the Jet Ski video, right? For like 900 million views. That's insane. What on a three minute video? And it's just like a dumb prank where like we like pretend like we're going to tie someone up and pull them off on a jet ski and we keep them hooked to the three minute mark. And we had such a fun day that day and it was such a crazy journey. Like, so I, I kept some of them up, but like we took a ton down. And my intention is to focus more on positive content yeah. rather and Julius Dean content. Because it's a bit confusing. It's like, why is Julius Dean posting videos that he's not necessarily in on his Facebook page? Doesn't really make sense. And I think with a brand, you have to kind of align everything. Mm -hmm. It's like you can't have different brands on different pages unless it makes sense. Could you right? have renamed that page to JD Fun Stuff and then started a new page for yourself? Probably. Probably could. But you made a strategic decision not to do that. Oh, it's just when you have 44 million followers on a I Facebook know. page. I know. It's hard to start from zero. Yeah. <laughs> And I also look, since then I posted a magic video on there, this bubble video, 50 million views, right? On a, on a 10 second video, posted some, 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 some different types of magic tricks, I've got, you know, millions of views. So the fans are there, the community's there. I'm planning some really awesome active, like types of content. Yeah. You know, so. I think you can do it. Yeah, yeah. So, so look, it's been, it's been a wild one and, and it's been a, a massive learning curve, but I think that ultimately, big question for anyone, 
who's creating content is the why. I think if you chase the money, sometimes the money will come. In my scenario, like we took a jump on this viral video business and was, you know, it, it, the business paid off yeah. from the risk. But then it's easy to lose sight of the why. Exactly. The why is the everything. If you, once you start to focus on revenue, then you, you can lose the why. So if you had to summarize your why right now. I think I want to bring goodness to the world. I want to create empowering content. I want to travel, bring magic to, to the lives of people that have never seen magic. So that's exciting for me. So as I say, like, for the pandemic, me and my friends are having the best time. We're going to, to orphanages in, in um, Johannesburg, South Africa. We're doing IDF soldiers in Israel. Like, we're doing, just doing wild film trips that were really exciting and authentic. Yeah. Authentic. Creating an authentic connection with people. And it's such a beautiful thing, magic, the way that people understand it all over the world. Like, you don't need to speak English to understand my videos. Do you ever lose your passion for magic? Is it something where you always feel like you love it 100% or does it go up and down? I think that it's very complicated when you're running a social media business because a normal magician, to some extent, or they're probably in the same way, some magicians, they've got to deal with clients, got to deal with invoices, they've got to deal with accountants, they've got to deal with all types of things, you know? Mm -hmm. For me, like running this like multifaceted social media business, it's just very confused. It's not my it's not my forte. Yeah, I like I'm a creative. I'm not you know we can't all be corporate lawyers with <laughs> you know mathematical minds and structured thought processes. I'm a creative. I'm, like, I'm thinking here. I'm thinking there. So I think that it can be difficult. But I do love the brand. I do love magic. Um, I just think for that, you know, as I develop my business and my structure, I hope that I can build processes for things that are very difficult. Like, for example, like editing. Like I used to, I, I, I'm so used to editing all my own videos. Yeah. But then with, during the pandemic, when we did this viral video business, I had multiple editors. So that was really cool because I was like, wow, like we're, we're producing, I'm producing content and it's turning around at such a fast speed. And but part of the reason I got burnt out before I was traveling with a stylist because I was editing so much. Like I'd go out and film videos and I'd go home and I'd spend five hours editing. It was just a lot of work, you know? So I think that when the two go together, it can be confusing because it's hard to know, like, am I burnt out because of the magic? Am I burnt out because of the grind? But I think that the more I or can- people management. Yeah, exactly. I think, I think just for you as well, like the more, yeah. I, the more we, we can build our businesses, I think the more time it will have for us to focus on what we enjoy doing. I think so. I wish you could outsource everything that you don't like about business and then only keep the creative parts that you like. I know, I wish. I wish it could happen like that. I wish. How does that work? You know, I don't know. You hire, Once that, you figure out, tell me. <laughs> yeah, how would you hire like a really good manager, director, COO? Yeah. Do you enjoy the business side of it or do you think it's necessary to survive in the magic world to make an income? I do enjoy the business of it. I really do. It's, it's exciting with social media. Yeah. How crazy it is like to be in a time like this. Yeah. Like the world we're in right now. Magic is inherently viral. On an algorithm level, the fact you have to watch it multiple times means it just pops. If you get a good video, it pops. And on a personal level, fun to perform magic and to take that brand of like, where is, where, is, how far can you push magic? Is it gonna be magic on the streets of London? Magic on a live stage? Magic with celebrities? Magic with homeless people? Like, it's really cool. It's, I love the brand. The business is, it does take the creativity out of me. I'll be honest with you. Once it becomes a business and you have to start dealing with the nitty gritty of a business, it is hard to focus on the creative, which is yeah. I'm sure a problem that you have as well, would you say? I think so. I think there's a lot of creators experience burnout and sometimes when you really just want to create content to for one certain aim, but there's all of these logistics involved, it takes some of the fun out of it, Right. for sure. What is a content creator at the end of the day? As you scale as a content creator, you become a business owner. And I think it's crazy because when people hear your name, they think of you as this world famous magician, but actually I think of you as a business person. I've seen, we've talked extensively about how you're thinking about algorithms, how you're thinking about creating content and what has to happen, all the people you have to have in place to make that happen. Mm. It is, you are a business owner. You are an entrepreneur. Probably first, second content creator and magician. Yeah, so something funny. When I first started using social media, it was to actually get more gigs. So I found out, like, this was a few years ago, like, I realized that the best magicians were, were going to the top of Google. Like, the, 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 the most uh, booked magician is because they were number one on Google. So I started making videos so I could put the backlink to my website. So that way I would rank higher on Google, right? So that's literally why I started making videos in the first place. I thought if I can get more backlinks to my website, then I'm gonna get more bookings, be able to do bigger corporate events and my rate can go from $500 to $1,000. Maybe I do $2,000 gigs you know, in the future if I do it. And it ended up being the case that my, my website went right to number one on Google. And as the 
business transition from doing live performances to, to social media and magic, my website went down, right? <laughs> <laughs> when I say went down, I mean like the domain expired and I didn't, I didn't even realise for, 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 oh, for, no. for, for weeks or months on end. But it just shows how like the focus shifted over time. And why did that focus shift? You were so set on getting these gigs. Was it just the money? There was more money in social media or? It wasn't at the time necessarily the money. It was the opportunity. Again, like we're living in such a crazy time, like where you post a video from your mobile phone and it reaches millions of people. I'm sure you're, you're now more desensitized to it, but it is a crazy time. So at the time I was just watching my Facebook page explode. My Instagram was blowing. Like people, at, and at the end of the videos, I would say like, yo, tell me where to go next. So I became like this world traveling magician machine with like a vision of like, right, my audience is gonna live vicariously through me. I'm gonna travel the world, do magic, pop up here or there. And I love it. I love traveling. I love magic. I love meeting new people. I love, I love the brand, right? It's really fun. Like, like how cool is that brand? Like just being this like amicable yeah. street magician. It's not like Justin Bieber, like super like untouchable, too good looking you know, extremely wealthy. Like, it's not like a, a classic celebrity. It's like a very relatable character. Like, oh, you know this magician? Oh, it's Julius Dean. You know, oh, but oh, cool. You know, I rock up in Germany, I rock up in India, I rock up in Miami, Israel, like wherever it is. And people would start to follow this journey of like a world traveling street magician. So for me, that was something so much bigger than doing gigs at a party. And could you ever have anticipated that social media would create that for you? Evolved over time. But when I was at UCLA, I saw like the Viners, the YouTubers, Vitaly, Logan Paul, Amanda Cerny, like I saw uh, Cameron uh, Dallas at the time, like these guys blowing. And I was like, damn, like they're living the life, a life that they've, they've carved for themselves through social media. How many actors are there in LA? But Cameron Dallas, Logan Paul, Amanda Cerny are like, like they're getting amazing opportunities. Yeah. Right. So social media, I saw as a way of scaling my business, right? Like back in the day, if you want to get a TV show as a magician, you have to meet the right producer, pitch the right show. It's gonna be the right place, right time. David Blaine. Why did David Blaine get his TV show? He's an amazing magician. He's probably met like, someone. Probably, probably some luck involved. Him, yeah. Probably some luck involved. I mean, amazing. But so, same with Chris Angel. Same with Pell and Teller. Like, it's a mixture of hard work and luck. Yes. But what would I rather do? Would I rather wait around for a producer? Would I rather reach tens of millions of people, build a global audience, command my own platforms, yeah. scale my own business? Like, am I going to wait around or am I going to just be proactive? And it's so fun. What's the best opportunity that's come out of it for you? Like for me, look, there's so many things that came out of being a famous magician, right? I got collabs with huge celebrities, right? I got Drake messaging me, I got Post Malone following me. Like that's cool, yeah. amazing opportunity. There's, um, you know, there, there's being invited to perform at like, you know, award shows in Monte Carlo in front of, you know, billionaires and 192 countries, live, globalized, TV commercials. Like on a corporate level, those are the opportunities. Like I was getting the biggest opportunities being, you know, paid six figures plus to do like these things is obviously incredible. Yeah. However, in my opinion, the best opportunity was inherent within itself that like I had the opportunity in my life to command a, a global audience posting magic tricks on the streets mm -hmm. and having this following that lived vicariously through me and to be in that position is so valuable. And I'm so like, uh, like appreci appreciative for like actually having that opportunity because it evolved through hard work and through luck. But as you know, you're in a crazy position right now, right? Like you blowing on TikTok and Instagram, like it's wild. <laughs> People are like, they're lapping up your, your information, your education, they're living through you. Like, oh wow, the American Airlines thing. Like, I try that. Like you get to connect with people. Yeah. Connect with people on a universal level. Like that's, that for me is the biggest opportunity. It's very cool, it's very yeah. powerful. How much does an average magician make? Or for these gigs, how yeah. much is the potential that you can make for one gig, two gigs? There's a spectrum. Yeah. Right? If you want to book Chris Angel for a gig, he might charge you a million dollars. If you want to book your average magician from London, he might charge you five, six hundred dollars to do magic. Right? There's a massive spectrum. And does it really depend on if you're a better magician, you command better prices, or it's all PR? If you have more publicity and hype around you, you command better prices. I think it's both. It's like a bag. Is that Chanel bag actually worth $10,000? Some PR, <laughs> but there's probably also some quality. Yeah. Like you're not going to buy a crappy Chanel bag for $10,000 that falls apart. In the service business, I'm sure it's the same with lawyers. You can pay a lot of money for a lawyer that's not so good. You can also pay a lot of money for an amazing lawyer. Same with magic. Whatever price you set, supply meets demand. That's the price you can charge. Yeah. So there are amazing magicians that don't know how to brand themselves. And they'll go out and do a gig and they get paid, you know, a few hundred dollars because that's what they know. 
probably undiscovered. Yeah. Did you ever have a traditional job? Not magic, not content creation? I worked on a cruise ship when I was 21. Oh yeah? Yeah, I was doing a, what? I was an entertainment host. Oh. So I would like host kids club, host karaoke, like make friends with all the, all the it was a sick job when I loved it. <laughs> but then I right caught. after you started creating content. But I did it for six months. I, I, sorry, I wasn't 21, I was 18. I was about to go on a gap year. I did a gap year where I traveled around the world by myself. Yeah. Went to Thailand, Asia, South America, like just on this like backpack trip. I was on like my own little trip just to have the have have a fun year before I start university. And I got a job for, for for six months on a cruise ship. Yeah, something like that. You know what's crazy is we met through Lewis House mm. like earlier this year. I watched a podcast that you did with him five years ago. Jesus. He asked you a question about where you wanted to be five years from then. 2017, so now we're, we're five years from then. What do you think you said? I don't know. <laughs> so you said you wanted to achieve 15 to 20 million followers, and now you're at 44 million. Wow. You also said you wanted to do collabs with people, and obviously you've collabed with Drake, Post Malone, all of these people. That was kind of it. So I was thinking, I was watching that, and I was like, oh my gosh. Wow. He accomplished everything he said he would accomplish wild so now what do you want to achieve five years from now and someone in five years when i'm not irre- not relevant is going to be like erica, <laughs> on joking, erica podcast. you want to be like a hundred million follower tiktok yeah? <laughs> no. have a global business <laughs> houses all over the world <laughs> no, and you're no. still going to be standing outside trying to find cheaper taxis and ubers <laughs> don't tell people that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. not <laughs> yeah where do you want to be five years from now what do you want to accomplish i think i want to have philanthropic element to my to my content. I think it's so awesome right now when I see like Jimmy Darts and not so much Mr. Beast, to be honest with you. That kind of feels a bit like for the sake of making content. I'm giving away a million dollars, you know, but like there's some content that has a really like inspiring nature to it. It feels very authentic, not produced, authentic. So look, I'd love to be to be doing good in my brand. You know, if I could have done 45 billion views on like something positive, I think that would, that would feel very, very nice for me. And I think it would be something that I would want to dedicate my life and time to so yeah having a philanthropic element to my brand to my business to my life hope to achieve that over the next few years whether that is creating more incredible content in parts of the world where people don't see magic whether that be fundraising of some sort whether that be setting up my own charity that be speaking at conferences that have like important topical issues i think mm-hmm. i think that gets me excited what doesn't get me excited is like ah, oh, i can make you know x amount of money yeah that doesn't get me excited it's not like yes i can make money like I was, I went through a period where it was like, whoa, like, this is what I want. And now through a period where like, that's not what I wanted. And that's not what, it's not why I do what I do. That's important on a business level. Having my processes worked out be so rewarding. Yeah. Like at the moment, like I have a great team, I have a great business, but I'd like to bring it all together, you know, and maybe in the future, I'd like to have like my own production company. I think that'd be really cool. You know what's funny is yeah. on that same podcast with Lewis Howes, mm. he asked you what you anticipated your biggest challenge would be. What do you think it was? Team building? Yep. That's what you said. Is that what I said? Yeah. yeah it's a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> that's been mine too, honestly. Oh, that's the gosh. toughest part of yeah. building a business. It's just yeah. figuring out how to build the right team around you, mm. manage them, keep everyone happy yeah, and incentivized. For real. Like, and everyone's so, yeah, it's like so, as you can imagine, like when you, when you train someone up and you work with them for so long and then one day like, they get burnt out and they're like, oh, I can't do this anymore. So, like, oh, you know everything about what I do. I, I need you. That's why and you have to create these standard operating procedures exactly. where you have everything written down exactly. before so, they burn out. Because if they're burnt out, they're not going to write it all down. Facts. Well, listen, Lewis Howe said to me, you have to get your team to write up what they do. Yep. So I have all my team right now, like writing up everything they do. So that way, like, if we want to bring new people on, we have it all written out, like a Julie Steen, like, internal yeah. structure. Can That's you show me some magic? Show you some magic? Yeah. Show you one trick. One trick? Okay. All right. So this entire time, I've actually been influencing a card on you, right? I've been making you think of a card. Really? Yeah. Okay, so think of a card for me. Yeah? You've got a, you've okay. Got a, okay, I've got, a, I've got a pack of cards here. Okay, think of a card. Okay. Right, three, two, one, change your mind. Okay. Three, two, one, change your mind again. Okay. Okay. Was it a king? No. Oh. What was it? Three of hearts. <sighs> we can redo it. No, I'm joking. Oh. That's so sweet of you. I actually turned a card over. What card did you say? Three of hearts. If I go through like this, all the cards face up, apart from one card that's turned over. Take it out. <laughs> oh my gosh 
I thought you messed up. I was so nervous for you. <laughs> I was like, let's redo it. No worries. Wow. I have no idea how you did that. I changed my mind so last minute thinking, wow, I thought I tricked you when you said king. <laughs> I know, I know. You were so happy as well. That's yeah. crazy. How long have you been implanting <laughs> this in my head to pick the three parts? An hour? Four hours now? <laughs> <laughs> have you just been like... <laughs> yeah, hard. I loved, I loved, me and my ex-girlfriend loved to travel <laughs> for three months. <laughs> the thing is, I couldn't... I play poker sometimes, but I couldn't remember anything besides diamond and heart. Like, I can't remember the other four. Mm, clubs the other and spades. Two. Oh, okay. Yeah. I couldn't remember those, so my choices were limited to those two. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> so how long does it does something like that take to learn? Three, oh, <laughs> how long does it take to do? I take three minutes. <laughs> three minutes in 2021. Uh, that took me a lifetime to learn. Yeah, being able wow. to suggest a card in your mind. You know, everything. Do you have different tiers of, like, this is the hardest trick, this is the easiest trick I know? I guess it's like lore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's levels. Yeah, there's levels, yeah. yeah. Were you able to, when you were running the entire production team, do you still have to constantly practice to keep up your skill? See, I'm a very extreme person, right? And that's my problem. So, like, when I'm on the magic, I'm on the magic. When I'm on the running a team and scaling a business, it's hard for me to be creative. So, I wasn't so focused on learning magic. I did learn tricks every now and then. <laughs> but my like my 95% my focus was on like, you know, dealing with the nitty gritty of like building a team. Yeah. You know, so yeah, now that the stress is off a lot, you know, I'm getting back to like learning cool tricks and prepping my next content adventures. How do magic consultants work? Do they have the tricks and then they come and teach you? So the way magic consultants work is that like, okay, imagine you have like a choreographer, right? They'll come up with the dance moves. So someone's going on stage, you know, they, they teach you the, the dances if you're, you know, Former. So a magic consultant, very similar. Every time we do a, a particular setting, so for example, we go to Mumbai, India, we want to create tricks or, or a brand deal. Let's say we want to do a brand deal with Uber. I have a team specialized in helping come up with the creative for magic. Now, I am in my own way, obviously a magician and a magic consultant. So I'm very much involved in like the creative, like what tricks is it going to be, to learn the tricks, how are we going to do it, how are we going to apply it to a certain setting. But a magic consultant will, will help with that. Sometimes, you know, depending on how involved they are, be very yeah. involved. And you have different types of consultants. You have TV magic consultants. You have magic consultants for stage. So if David Blaine's going on tour, he'll have, like, his magic team. I'll have my team that work with me on brand deals and cool activations and, make, um, and, and making tricks work for certain settings or, you know, content consultants. Yeah. So, yeah, that's how it works. And, and you hire them them for a week, hire them for a month, hire them for, you know, on a salary. Can you tell when another magician does a trick in front of you, can you usually tell how they did it? Yeah, usually. Wow. I wish you could, like, come along with me to magic shows and just, like, <laughs> tell me this is how he did it. I don't like the mystery. Like, this is going to bother me for at least a good day. <laughs> <laughs> a good day. A good day. Good, good, good. Glad I've left my, mem my, my mark. <laughs> So we have to talk business and money a little. You mentioned that you now know that you're not driven by money. Yeah. Do you still have a money goal? Like, I want to achieve this much net worth by this age. Not really. Like, if I didn't make it, if I don't, if I don't make another penny in my life, I think I'll be like, okay. Because you don't really spend your money. You live a very frugal yeah. life. Yeah, I don't, I don't. Some money more. Yeah, I mean, I would like to, at some point, treat myself a little bit. Yeah. So I'd like to, like, buy, like, a nice place for myself get like a semi-decent car at some point, maybe not now, but yeah, I want to, I want to invest smart. I want to diversify my portfolio, buy some property, buy some stock, buy some crypto, invest in some VCs, like just diversify and de-risk. Um, have you already done that or what have a little you done bit. with the money? I've, I've invested in some stocks, invested in some crypto. Um, I have some VCs that I'm looking to invest in, but I'm in no rush. There's a global market crash coming hopefully soon. <laughs> So I basically, hopefully, we'll get everything, get, get, get some stocks at a discount. Yeah, the sale's happening. The sale, exactly. And, and I think there's a lot of money to be made. You know, I mean, Facebook dropped by 30% and I, I, I invested. I did too. Yeah. Facebook just prints money. I mean, it's so obvious to me that they're going to continue to do well. Yeah, exactly. Not, a, not an endorsement, but... Yeah, yeah. I invested half a million dollars into Facebook stock and I've just watched the stock go up and down, up and down, up and down. <laughs> I think I'm down like... 10k right now <laughs> that's the best thing though is just to invest and, and not look it, at yeah, it yeah, leave exactly. it for 10 years yeah, and exactly. then you can look exactly exactly because the biggest mistake is people get emotional with it yeah and then they sell at the wrong time yeah exactly so i'm gonna ask what everyone really wants to know how much money did you actually make on facebook 
So I'm not going to tell you how much money specifically, <laughs> but it was a, uh, it was an eight-figure business. Wow. In the year and a half, two years that you were doing that? Yep. And how are you investing that money? Have you already invested all of it? or? I'm bullish on crypto. I'm bullish on s- s- the stock market. Looking at some property investments. My aim is to de-risk and diversify. I'm not desperate to jump into the market. I think that FOMO is a big issue. Yeah. And yeah, you, f- you can feel very pressured to like, oh, I need to put in, you know, put in, you know, millions of dollars into Luna. Boom, there's a crash. You For know. sure. So no, I'm in no rush. But I bought some Facebook stock. How much? Half a million dollars. <laughs> so, but there was a, there was a, there was a drop. There was like a thirty percent drop. So, so oh, like a month and a half ago or two months ago? Yeah, a few months ago. Yeah. yeah. So, so, I, so I, I, I bought in on Facebook. Um, I bought in some stock onto Tesla, um, the S and P, but. I do think there's going to be a market crash, and I think that's the best time to buy. Like you saw what happened during the when COVID first came out. Like mm. there was a cry, a dry, like anyone that bought into the S and P during when the pandemic first happened, like they doubled or tripled their money, right? Yeah, yeah. It was, it was like it was like that drop. Have you always been in, interested in investing in finance, or was it only since making all of this money that you decided, oh, I need to educate myself? Yeah, like I'm very bullish on investing. I always thought to myself like I have n- I've never had an interest in investing up until the point where I now have you know an amount of cash to invest to invest yeah and opportunities like this like which were like a revenue focused business as opposed to like a brand building focus you know they don't come every day and as I say like we got in early into this to, into the into the game so so yeah so now you know I would like to classically make my money work for itself that way I can focus on you know creating amazing content without having too much stress of, of diving into my savings yeah and I don't need to sell out on opportunities that I think aren't appropriate and I can just you know live the life I want so look as we both know investing is very important and as they always say like you know you can make money through business but you make you generate wealth of lifetimes of wealth through investing were your parents yeah. very good at money with their money or how did you gain this financial savviness? Um, Israeli Jewish background, you know, family, family, very careful with money. You know, I went to, to like a estate school, like not, not a private school. We always went on like cheap holidays to like India, like staying at like the one star hotels, like just very careful, frugal. Frugal is a great, a very, the word you used, but never, not, not really from an investing background, but as you know better than anyone right now, it's so, so much accessibility into how to invest. Yeah. Like oh. you can actually sign up on like an eToro, like a trading platform to invest. But look, stocks are interesting and people keep saying property, 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 right? Oh, you gotta get on property. For me, it sounds like a nightmare. <laughs> Buying a property, talking about, you know, getting a mortgage or not getting a mortgage, you know, just, just having to deal with an estate agent, the taxes, the, the paperwork, you know, if I wanna sell, I've gotta hold on to it. I've gotta find a buyer, the stamp duty in the UK, like there's so much involved in buying property. And there's so many ways to make money now. Yeah. You know, like I truly do, I truly do. But I would like to have, you know, in the next, however long it be, year, couple of years, I'd like to have 10 to 20% of my portfolio in real estate, because I think it's important because, you know, the dollar could crash. Yeah. The market could crash, you know, stocks could crash, crypto could crash, but real estate is not gonna crash, not unless unless it's an earthquake. And you're not in a rush, which is the nice thing. Exactly, I'm in- Wait for the right opportunity. Exactly, yeah, I'm in no rush. Uh, what would your recommendation be? Diversify. Mm. Anything that you're interested in and passionate about, you can invest a little in everything. But they say, you know, 90% or so should be traditional investments and then 10% or less riskier investments. Right. But people make up those percentages. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. Whatever yeah, you want Yeah, exactly. My accountant right now is like, you know, classic. Like, he's 55 years old. Obviously, he's thinking about maybe his pension. He's like, oh, yeah, you should... You know, put it all into ninety percent into safe security. You know, five percent <laughs> returns a year. I'm just like, that doesn't sound so fun. <laughs> you know, like I'm, I, I want, I, I'm happy to. I want to have a riskier portfolio. Or I say twenty, thirty percent. I would realistically be excited to have fifty up to fifty percent in risky. Whether whether that's new startups, crypto and Bitcoin with this high volatility. Like, yeah, I do find it exciting. But look, I can, I can afford. I'm twenty eight. I've got some savings. Like I can afford to be a bit more risky, my nature, but not stupid risky. Mm-hmm. Like the idea is, if some go to zero, I'll have some go three x, you know, or some twenty percent, ten percent returns. Yeah, yeah you, un- you understand. Like, listen, I'm also learning and just trying to find the right opportunities. But I'm, as I say, I'm, I'm in no rush. I'm in no rush. But 
yeah, look, maybe, maybe in the future I'll have some property. I've just got to figure out where I want to live long term. You know, I, I love Dubai. I love Miami. I love London. All great places. But once you start buying in one place, yeah. then you've got to start dealing with, like, you know, you've got to get an accountant for that country. You've got to get, you know, you've got to get... I feel like the most successful, like, real estate, like, the, the guys that own property, like, they own it all in one place. Where they live and yeah. where they feel very comfortable yeah. with. Yeah, and once they, once they build up, then maybe they can diversify and, and it's into different places what do you think yeah but you're quite young so i think what you're doing is right you don't have to rush into anything you never have to invest in something because someone said it was a good investment figure out what works for you at the time i do think eventually you'll want to build up a real estate portfolio but it doesn't have to be now yeah right now i don't think you know where you want to live exactly I think you yeah. need to figure that out and you also you may decide that you don't want to live in one place for the next 10 years mm. you might only commit to a place that one year at a time. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And right now, like I'm I'm you know, I'm cruising through Airbnb. I don't have a set location right now. Like, I'll get yeah. month to month, month in London, month in Dubai, a few months in America. Like, you know, I, I, I am quite a still a digital nomad. It's fun. Yeah. So perhaps before I dive into property, I'll think about renting somewhere, you know, on an annual basis. Whilst I, you know, I level up on a kind of, you know, step by step. Yeah. Yeah. At what point did you decide to surround yourself with your accountant and your wealth advisor? After my, this wild year, like I went through just like a bit of a mental, like what the f- going on? Like, I, I don't understand it. You know, I do not, under, I do not understand like taxes, investments, like what am I doing? Like, so, you know, I just had to put together a really good team, you know, yeah. and I had to hire like great people and they're not cheap. People that can help me understand my business, you know, which is really important. Which people were those? Um, honestly, my, I think my accountant has been really helpful. Like I, 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 I specifically found like a UK accountant who deals with, quote, entrepreneurs, international um, people, high net worth individuals, but like, you know, people that have businesses. You know, like, like obviously you have, your, like you have standard accountants and then you have like accountants that understand like the like global travel. Yeah. All right, like, you know, traveling across Mexico to America, Don't to the UK, country too many to months. Dubai. Like, yeah, exactly. Like, it's just really important that like you understand it and your team understand it. So that's given me a lot of peace of mind. Um, and it's allowed me to just understand my situation and, and just, you know, how to navigate my life. Yeah. You know, so like, do I want to invest from a company? Do I want to invest from my personal name? What are the tax implications of that? You know, if I live in the UK, then, you know, what, what's best? Do I live in, you know, how does it work? I can buy, oh, I can buy one property that doesn't have stamp duty. And then after that, so there's so many like complexities in terms of like how to navigate. So it's important to have good people. I mean, I, I don't have a wealth manager per se. I have friends that have different opportunities. They invest in VCs. They bring things to the table, but, but I don't specifically have like a wealth manager. So you're I think, still very I think, much directing it yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I'm, I'm learning, like, I'm learning myself for sure. You seem yeah. very much like someone who just does it yourself, figures it out. I w- if I had a great wealth manager, I would be very happy to give them like 30, 40, 50% of my portfolio and be like, right, there you go. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> very happily, right? It would just take a lot of stress off my mind. Yeah. But I don't. Hard Honestly, to find. it's hard to find. Just like your CEO that you've been searching for. Exactly, yeah. Too. Yeah, and like, look, it's well, hard to find. Wealth managers, they charge, what, they charge 1% a year and then what, 10, 20, 30% of the profits uh, of the, of the, is that kind of how it works with depending on the wealth manager? I'm not so sure. So they charge actually. a 1% annual fee. They charge, I think, 10 or 20% of like whatever the profits are, mm. which is fine if they're doing amazing returns. But like, it seems from my understanding that a lot of these wealth managers are very um, regulated. It means you can't be bit more creative or risky yeah. so i mean from my from my from speaking to wealth managers they've the, 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 and maybe i've just not spoken to the right one they kind of they promise like all right we give you a five percent return a year the smp is doing ten percent a year yeah so why would i pay you f- why would we do five percent for me where i'm paying you like a management fee and all these fees so it's gonna be four percent when i the smp is just standard it's been doing ten percent a year every year since since, since its inception so look i have a lot of learning to do right you're you're certainly more of an expert than me <laughs> um, but you know, I learn on the go, figure it out. But my most important thing is not to FOMO. Yeah. And that it will come. You know, I'm not. I'm in no rush. And everyone talks about investing this, investing in that, investing in that. But you know, cash is king. It is. Yeah. For young magicians out there yeah. who look up to you and aspire to be like you, what's your best advice for them? Got to follow the trends. Social media, jump on it as fast as possible. Film on your phone, portrait mode, no fancy cameras. Copy what works, get creative, have fun, visual content. <laughs> and if you're feeling crazy, go travel to some wacky countries and get authentic street magic reactions. 
Brilliant. And the name of the podcast, by the way, we've decided. It's called Erica Taught Me. Erica Taught Me. Love that. And so for the final question, what is one thing you want people to walk away and say, Julius Dean taught me? Okay. Let me just give you a very quick backstory. You already know this, but as I say, like one of my lessons from this year, I've always considered myself a magician and a viral marketer, right? Making things go viral. So when we went through this year in Mexico, I would post all these videos onto my Facebook page because it was like, I'm producing this content, I'm using my expertise as a viral marketer to create these viral videos, right? Whatever, it's under the name Julius Dean because it's my thing. If in the future, I'm seeing a lot of creators do it now, you start posting other people's videos on your social channels, like say you have friends that you make videos with, like just split the channels, like just keep your channel niche focused. That's what's great about your channel, Erica. Mm -hmm. like, when you're subscribing to your channel, like you know exactly what you're getting every time across TikTok and YouTube Shorts and Instagram. And it just works wonders on the algorithm. You know, just focusing on niche. Don't sway too far. And when you find something that works, go, go hard on it. That's say. very good advice. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Erica. Yay! If you've enjoyed the episode, please take a moment to leave a review. It really helps support what we're doing. Thanks for listening, and I'll talk to you next Tuesday on a brand new episode of Erica Taught Me.